thanks for downloading the show. Welcome to Garden Fork Radio. This is the eclectic DIY show. We talk about everything from pizza to uh, sheetrock, which is something might come up today. I'm here today with my friend Will from the Weekend Homestead. Welcome, sir. How are you doing, sir? I'm good. I am in Brooklyn, New York. You are in uh, Wisconsin, right? Yep, I'm in Wisconsin today. It is sunny and it's cold and there's a lot of snow. We have uh, no snow, and we had the uh, equinox moon, the full moon. It was it was super moon last night, so the days are going to get longer now. Well, nice thing is it's spring and it snowed here, so it's 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 going well for us. Yeah, um, we are going to talk about trash tag today, and then Will did a barn door installation that. Um, our other co-host Rick was very curious about, and we're also going to talk about uh, me making pizza in like four or five videos now, and I will post the last one uh, this coming Saturday. So, so there you go. So trash. Those are. Those are oh, sorry. No, go ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say those are some pretty good-looking pizzas. Yeah, um, I love making pizza, and if you're a longtime Garden Fork viewer, I made a uh, dry fit brick pizza oven in my driveway and the beauty of it is it breaks down you build it make your pizzas break it back down again there's no cement and a bunch of people have made that pizza oven and they send me pictures and emails and it's great and but I want to make pizza in my kitchen with my oven you know my kitchen oven and everyone's like well it doesn't get hot enough and but but I'm like well let's just try this so this will be the fourth video in a series I've been making about um, pizza. I was inspired about a video series by Alex, who's called Alex the French Guy Cooking on YouTube, who does a, a deep dive on a subject. And he's, I find him very engaging. He just was about making chocolate and he just did one about making croissants. And he is French, but he speaks, his English is very good and he's very entertaining to watch. And I thought instead of making one pizza video, why don't I do a series and we could ex explore different parts. The last one I just did is whether a pizza stone or a pizza steel is best for baking on. Very interesting. I was going to ask you about that because you have the, uh, the what are those terracotta plates or something like that in your, yeah. in your oven that you've been using, I've seen, and it's kind of neat. I had a pizza stone and I broke it, and the terracotta tiles are the same thing, um, basically. And I'm like, okay, well, that'll qualify as a stone. But my 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 stone, I cracked it in half while baking some bread on it. And um, and then I read about the pizza steel, and they're not cheap, but I actually bought the cheapest one because it was very highly rated. The people were like, you know, the other ones are thicker, but this one works just fine. I'm like, okay, I'll get the $40 one, you know? <laughs> so I, I'm guessing a person can't just take any tile and put it inside of your stone your ovening and cook it. Cause I'm guessing there's some tile that probably have chemicals in it or paint or something like that. Right. There are some tiles. Uh, I believe I, and this is just me, amateur guy, not a uh, scientist. There is some terracotta and some clay and clay and terracotta. I think are the same thing that have lead in it. And so that is uh, something you'd be careful of, but I got these terracotta tiles from a cooking store and they were uh, food rated. They were inexpensive, but they're great because they're it's just four tiles and I just leave them at the bottom of the oven. And when I want to cook, I throw them on the top rack and off we go. So I shouldn't use the leftover tiles I had from my shower project. No, no. Good to know. <laughs> but anyway, that video will post on Saturday on our YouTube channel. So just go to youtube.com slash garden fork. And um, I've eaten a lot of pizza the past couple of weeks, so I have to go to the gym now. <laughs> it is springtime to get working on that summer body that you always wanted, I think, is what's trending right now on the Internet. Yeah. So um, I pick up trash nonstop, whether I'm in the country or in the city. And I think I mentioned this to Will and he said, oh, well, you should we should talk about trash tag. Yeah, trash tag, actually, it, it started on. I think there was a company out in Colorado that did it with their employees. This is actually going on three years now, but for whatever reason, this January and February, it started trending on Twitter, Instagram, and Reddit, where people would go out and pick up trash in different areas. 
And then they would post pictures of the before and after of people picking up garbage and Time Magazine and BuzzFeed and all the uh, you know news outlets have been really talking about it. And it's it's actually uh, they're talking about a good hashtag that's trending, you know, with something really positive out there. So I thought, you know, when you like to talk about the positivity, that's one that's really picking up speed on the Internet right now. Yeah. So there's people on Instagram showing before and after pictures of uh, a lot of beaches and also woods. And it just crushes me to see trash like that um and i pick up trash every day so actually this trash tag thing my neighborhood in brooklyn here is um it's it's a mix of people that come from different cultures and some of them uh come from places where it's okay just to throw the trash out the front yard and uh that doesn't work here so i thought maybe uh we could create a trash tag an urban trash tag because we on in Brooklyn here, next door neighbor, the discussion board next door neighbor is pretty popular. It's an alternative to Facebook that I really like. So I thought I'd go up on there and say, post this article from Time Magazine and say, hey, why don't we do some trash tag tagging here uh, on our um, next door neighbor group, is it called for my for my neighborhood? Kind of maybe inspire people to uh, pick up trash. I see other people pick up trash in my neighborhood and it makes me smile. So. It's interesting, too, because like one of the articles was talking about how a bunch of folks would get together. They would find an area. They, you know, pick up the trash and everything like that. And then after that, they'd go out to dinner and it'd be kind of like a camaraderie thing or than just a, I'm going to go do this by myself. You know, groups of people going and working together and meeting your neighbors and stuff. And that's one of the pieces the article talks about is how it's bringing people from neighborhoods together who wouldn't normally be hanging out all of a sudden decide, hey, we're going to go do this. And, you know, it kind of becomes a little bit of a community event, which is cool. Our town where we have our little um, our little weekend cabin has a cleanup day on Earth Day every year. And we go down to the town hall and get trash bags. And then we're assigned different. You can pick or be assigned a different road to go clean. And then at the end, we bring our trash back to the town hall and there is a dumpster there. And they give uh, little thank you gifts. And it's usually uh, tulip bulbs or daffodil bulbs or... Uh, tree seedlings or something like that. And it's just a, it's a neat way to cook off, to kick off the spring. Cause during the winter, you don't always see your neighbors cause people are kind of hunkered down. I mean, you see them at the general store sometimes, but um, so maybe in your community, you could uh, start this on earth day and move forward. So I just, I, my big thing is plastic bags. Uh, they become tumbleweeds and I fully support a plastic bag ban across the country. I think they um, they end up in the ocean, and that is a bad thing. So I, I, I might not pick up all the trash on a sidewalk, but the wind blows plastic bags right at me, and I pick them up, and I, and, um, I either throw them out or I use them for dog poop. <laughs> I'd have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm really surprised. We have, we'll have the big, you know, summer, or the big uh, spring melt off of the snow, and part of our property is along a county road. And I'll get a black bag and I'll go out there and I'll walk along the, the ditches of the road. And I'm amazed that I'll fill two or three 55 gallon bags of stuff. And we're not on a big, busy road or anything like that. We're on a regular road. And it just surprises me how much stuff accumulates over the winter time. And I don't know why it happens, but for whatever reason, along the different county roads here, it, it builds up in the ditches. So we go and pick all of it up in the spring when the snow melts off. So it's. It's pretty surprising then how much garbage is out there. Yeah, it's weird. I um I pick up an awful lot of beer cans uh, along the country road when we go for walks. And I'm like, why is this here? <laughs> but anyway, so trash tag, if you are picking up trash, I'd love to hear from you. It's radio at gardenfork.tv. Oh, a little shout out to Jesse and Kevin, who are the GF radio technology experts. Um, they helped... Uh, Rick and I diagnose the audio problem we were having with uh, Rick's stuff. So I really, it's, it's, I kind of light up when I get an email from, well, I get an email from any of you all. It's great. Um, but Jesse responded and Kevin responded and we figured out the problem. And when Rick is on next, we'll talk about it. Um, sometimes it's best just to keep it simple uh, with your computer. I'll just say that. <laughs> Was that polite? I might need them to, I might need them to call me. Oh, yeah, because we just had a problem with Skype today. It's whenever Skype upgrades, to geek out for a minute here, everybody, um, something goes wonky 
with the with the microphone or the earphones or the recording software we use. So every time, if you're thinking of doing a podcast before I start the podcast, I use the built-in, I fire up Skype and I do the Skype call testing service to make sure the microphone works and the recording plugin works. And then I'm like, okay, at least, you know, I'm confident that it's working. But sometimes it doesn't and you have to upgrade something and all of a sudden you're scrambling. So, Yeah, that's that's what happened with me. I, I fired everything up and uh, you dialed me. We started talking and I'm yapping away on stuff. And you're like, hello, are you there? And I'm like, oh, man, all the best stuff is lost again. <laughs> so Rick and I were talking about barn doors and you have installed at least one of them. Yes, it it. I will say this, it was a super easy project and a lot of people are like, well, how does this work and how does it go together? And I'm actually working on a video right now to show how the barn door works and operates and the install, but it was very, very straightforward. And there's, I actually think installing a barn door, quite honestly, is easier than installing a swing door into a house, you know, just like a regular standard door frame. Oh, it is. It totally is. I think the key let me know if I'm wrong, is to find the studs in your wall. Yes, that is one. But the other item is with the barn door, if you look at the photo of the barn door that we put together, we took a piece of trim, basically a, a one by four. You can also use a one by six if you want something a little bit bigger. And you make it as long as the track. And then instead of having to figure out the track to hit all the perfect spots and to get it to line up, instead you screw the board onto the wall and mount that. And then you mount the door onto that board so that then if the brackets for the track don't necessarily line up exactly to your studs or if the it's off a little bit or, um, you know, how it goes together, that right. then you're screwing into that board. So you just make the board whatever length you need. So you hit a couple of the studs and the header above the door and then once the rail's installed, you just basically take any door. We just took a regular stock door, and my buddy Todd uh, trimmed the bottom of the door off for the right height, mounted the hardware on the top, hooked it on, and it was done. Literally, it was it was that simple. That is brilliant, only, yeah. Well, the only other thing you have to think about is, and it, it was the question that Rick was asking is, well, how do you make it so that the door stops and doesn't swing out and doesn't come off the track and all those? And the manufacturers, if you buy a reasonably priced one, I mean, you can't necessarily buy the cheapest one, but um, most of the reasonably priced ones have a functionality where at the top of the rail, there's these two brackets that you turn and it basically holds the door in a track so you can't lift it off of the track so it would fall off so you don't push it and then all of a sudden it falls off towards you. And then on the floor, there's a small, it looks like a little T that mounts in that you just screw into the floor and that prevents the the door from swinging out into the space and having it kind of swing freely. So between the bracket piece on the top and that little T piece on the bottom, there's no way that the door can go anywhere other than sliding left to right. And it all comes inside the kit, which is the best part. Oh, that's great. Now I'm looking at my office, which does not have a door, um, and thinking I could put one of these little barn doors on there. Huh. They have so, so many different designs, so many different colors and patterns. Um, yeah, we actually, the kit that I bought, we bought on Amazon and it just showed up. It was inside of a really long box and it had a very, very simple, almost Ikea like um, instructions, if that's a fair way to describe how to do it. I think yeah. any DIY person could easily do this. And the best part about it is you just go to the home improvement store and buy the door or you can buy a used one somewhere, probably preferably one without a hole in it, you know, from a, for a locking mechanism. Right. And then it mounts in. But if you do get one with a hole, they have plates that go on either side of the door that cover that up that make it so there's a nice handle on there. So you, when you open it and close it. Oh, did you just disappear? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You can actually, at the home improvement store, you can buy, I call them dummy knobs. They might be called non-functioning knobs, might be the name. But if you have like the wrought iron black hardware of the barn door, you can get, um, you know, black plated um, doorknobs. And they don't turn or anything, but it's a regular doorknob that you can mount and they would cover up that hole very nicely. Are you, are you talking like the silver or black circle mount piece? Yeah, yeah. Is it, 
The only thing I'd suggest on that is when the door, when you're on the other side of the door, so on the side that the door, if it's one that you walk through, you want to have something to grab onto on the other side. So actually when they sell the kit, it's kind of neat. On the back side, there's a you, you take a chisel or something, you scrape out basically a little square, and then this metal piece fits on there so your hand can slide into that little hole. And now you can open the door from one side, and then on the other side, you have your regular handle that you can grab onto to move it left and right on the other side. Because if there's a knob, when the door swings or slides shut, it would hit the jam on the other side. <laughs> yeah, that would be an Eric thing to do that and then go, oops. <laughs> and all right, so on the bottom... There's a little T thing. So you don't have to cut a slot in the bottom of the door for a little piece of metal to ride in. You, it's just there's this bracket that will hug the uh, sides of the door to keep it from basically being pushed out away from the wall then. Correct. So between the little rubber pieces up on the top that make it so you can't lift the door off of the track. So yeah. that will make it so the top doesn't swing out. And then on the bottom, you just need one little piece that they they give you a piece of paper that you can actually set on the floor and it actually shows you basically okay if your door is swinging here here's where you should put this piece and you literally install that piece hang the door turn the little two rubber brackets on the top and it, it's done that is so nice and i especially like your idea of putting up like a you could essentially put like a like a one by six piece of pine because in older homes even in new homes you're your studs are supposed to be on 16 inch centers and the barn door brackets are probably have, they're probably metal with holes drilled at 16 inch centers. And so you could just mount a piece of wood, paint it the same color as your wall or paint it black to make it look like it's part of the wrought iron or something. And then that makes it go so much faster. That is really brilliant. Well, the other trick to it also is, is no wall is perfectly straight or flat. So You know, it's supposed to be, but in a lot of cases, like even ours, there was a slight bow in the wall at that point. So you can shim behind it a little bit to make it so that your door moves evenly. Because if you just mount it to the wall, they were talking about a lot of folks had issues with it would rub a little bit on one spot or another because the wall would come out or go back. Well, by hanging that piece of wood up on the top, now you can make that nice and flat level and a good solid surface to work off of, which is great. Do you shop on Amazon? I shop locally and also on Amazon and other online stores. If I need something very specific, like seat covers for the new used car we just bought, I will go online and sometimes use Amazon. And Garden Fork happens to have a dedicated shopping page on the Amazon site now, which is very cool. It is an affiliate linked page. We do get a finder's fee for anything that you buy when you start shopping from that page. But I list there interesting items that I think are worthy of the Garden Fork DIY person. It's amazon.com slash shop slash Garden Fork. If you would start your Amazon shopping experience, no matter what you're looking for on Amazon, start it at Garden Fork and that would be great. It's amazon.com slash shop slash Garden Fork. That's amazon.com slash shop slash Garden Fork. I'm dealing with a similar thing, except it's a ceiling. Uh, Speaking of things being wonky, the uh, bathroom ceiling has actually been dropped. There's a tin ceiling, which I had to tear through to fix some plumbing from the floor above. Uh, The toilet pipe was a problem. And then they put in a drop ceiling underneath that because this was a, a rental building and they just were doing quickie things. And you get up eye level with that drop ceiling now, which is five inch sheetrock and a bunch of scrap lumber. It just, it wobbles the whole whole way across. And I had to cut a really large hole in it. And I put in a piece of patch sheetrock and I mudded and I put a compound on there and I can't make the thing. I can't match the wobble of the original ceiling. Cause my piece of sheetrock is, brand new so it's 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 level and straight you know so i'm going to it's a small bathroom and i realized i could just put up quarter inch drywall and re-sheetrock the whole ceiling and it would take less time than me trying to match the wobble and warp of the ceiling 
That that actually works out perfect. I mean, that's sometimes what you have to do. I mean, we have a project where I'm not going to take the ceiling down in the in the space that we're going to work in. And instead, I'm just going to put tongue and groove pine right over the top of what's there. And you can fix a lot of issues without having to have a huge mess and demo issue. You know, so that's that's sometimes the best way to go is to cover something up. I mean, you don't always want to do that because sometimes you need to fix the stuff underneath. But still, it makes a, a DIY project go a lot faster and a lot cleaner if you can do that kind of stuff. What my thought was to um, find the studs that are there and put um, one by twos, just run one one by twos right on, basically parallel right on top of those studs. So they'll be sitting on the sheetrock. I'll drill through the sheetrock into the studs. So the one by two will basically a furring strip and then I can re-rock the ceiling. But this whole idea of the tongue and groove gives me an idea now that maybe the client um, would like a, a decorative ceiling like that, you know? Well, one of, the, one of the things you can do too in that scenario is when you have those, um, not to geek out on building and construction for a minute, but when you're putting oh, yes. up those, <laughs> those one by twos, one of the things that uh, my buddy Todd had showed me is, you know, you run a chalk line across or you have something on the, on the wall so you can figure out like what your heights are, maybe tie a string across. And then if one of them needs to be a little thicker or a little bit thinner, you can run those through a table saw and you might have a one by two in one spot and then you might have to shave a quarter inch off the next one and, and so on and so forth as you go across the ceiling and you can make yourself a really level surface really, really quickly. And it doesn't matter what it looks like because you're going to cover it up with whatever the product is that you're going to put up there. Yep. So, you know, those little shim strips, we had to do that along the block wall in our 1960s home um, up in Wisconsin the the walls the concrete block walls were not very straight so what ended up happening is we marked a line on the floor to say okay here's what we want the wall to be and then we made the furring strips you know we need 10 of them and then just stripped down a couple of them on a table saw he screwed them to the wall and we were in business we had a place to you know mount stuff too plus you get a little bit of a gap that you can put in some insulation or a vapor barrier or any of those types of things that can help you know solve different problems that you might have down the road yeah, I'm, now my mind is just like flying. I'm like, oh, what could we do here? But the only thing that holds me back from that is because it's a stack of bathrooms. You know, it's a three-story building and there th the three bathrooms are right on top of each other. If I ever have to open up that bathroom ceiling again, if I used like tongue and groove um, wood as a decorative ceiling, I would have to rip that ceiling out. I might have to rip that ceiling out to do another plumbing repair. I wonder... I'll have to think about that because it would look great, what about, you know. Well, what about um, have you seen the ceilings where people use the 12 by 12 tin tiles where it's that thin tin metal? So yeah. you put your 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 boards up, then you put a flat surface and then you put those tin pieces up. And if you ever had to get in there, the most you'd have to do is remove, you know, four of those tin squares and then, you know, just have a couple extra and then you just put them right back up into the spots and you would never even know you were in there. I have done that. I've actually opened up tin ceilings and um, you have to be really careful uh, and keep it real. If you take down an old tin ceiling, it's got lead paint in it. All right. So wear a mask and wrap all that stuff up. But yeah, it's actually a lot of times easier to fix a tin ceiling because you can just kind of rebend the tin back into place and then you glop on latex paint let it dry a little bit and then you go back up there with your brush and you glop more on and you kind of distress it to match the other tin that and so the disturbed tin you're blending in there and it's at least eight feet away from you when you're on the ground well no it's at eight feet high so it's depending on how tall you are and if your eyes are failing then it looks just fine you know <laughs> i will say that going back to the barn door for a second you know a lot of people the the type of scenario you just talked about is exactly the scenario why you might want to consider a barn door because a swing door most of them are a fixed height and you can trim them down but it's difficult to get them to work properly versus the barn door where i mean if you needed a six foot tall door you could easily you know shave off the bottom of a door and since it's a single slab you could you know take a little off the top a little off the bottom and the door would look right versus if you have a swing door where you have limited options on how you can shave that down. So for po for folks who have, you know, limited ceiling height, like we only have seven foot ceilings in the basement. And then I had ductwork in some areas. So it was really hard to get a swing door to fit in there. By putting in a barn door, we were able to cut a slab door down to the exact size. And it looks like it was actually meant to be there. Neat. 
Well, I think people are almost at their destination, but I wanted to real quick talk about maple syrup. Uh, my season is really late. How's how's your as well? We actually haven't started. I, I've seen some of the neighbors putting the blue bags out. I was actually talking to one gentleman. He's got 530 taps that they run at their property and they do it all in bags and buckets. And I was like, wow, that's, that's so they're going to start putting them out. They're going to start putting them out this weekend. So the the bags, if anyone is curious about that, it's a it's a similar it's called a spile. It's what you you drill a hole in the tree and you you drive this in. So it's like a little spout, and then you hang what looks like a metal bracket about eight inches wide, maybe, and clamped to that is a plastic bag. And so the sap drips into the plastic bag instead of the uh, metal buckets. The metal buckets can be a little clunky to deal with. The plastic bags, I've I've never seen them. I've only seen them online. I've never seen anyone around me use those, but I'm curious. The thing about the... It's- the the metal buckets, which is good, is if the sap freezes, you can pull out the frozen part and you're you're concentrating the, the syrup already with a plastic bag. I don't know if you can do that. Well, one other thing on the plastic bag, too, is you can't just use any plastic bag. Um, the bags that they buy are actually, I don't want to say specifically made for maple syrup, but it helps block the UV light going in so that then it doesn't spoil the sap as the sun is hitting that bag. So, you know, like if a bucket, the light can't get through it to spoil the sap right. versus these bags where they're semi-transparent. So I asked them, I said, how does that work? And they said, it's a UV stable plastic that the bags are made out of one, so the sun doesn't kill them every year. And two, that the sun doesn't uh, spoil the sap in there. So I thought that was kind of neat. And then everything just folds up really small when they're empty. And he said, it's really easy to store. To store 500 buckets would take a huge amount of space yes. versus one or two gray totes that have all their you know, plastic bags in them. Had not thought of that. Yeah. I like, I mean, I like the lines. I run lines and then I have a, a collection barrel at the end, but the season, it ran a little bit last week, but it's at least three weeks late for me. It's very interesting, but it's mud season now. I got my quad stuck. I was trying to haul sap up to my evaporator, which is up on a little bit of a hill behind my house. And uh, man, did I tear up the yard pretty bad. <laughs> See, we're still in that season where everything melts off during the day, but then it refreezes. So in the morning you walk outside and you fall down on the patio or something like that very easily. Not saying that happened to me yesterday, but could no. have. <laughs> I will say if you are thinking of uh, buying an ATV, a quad, um, make sure it has a winch in the front or install a winch on the front. Cause I, I have a winch on mine and I, and it has this kind of dinky rope. It came with this dinky rope and I'm like, Oh, this should be a better substantial cable, but I got stuck in the mud and I wasn't about to respool, you know, um, stranded braided cable. And so I hooked this, uh, rope around first an apple tree and then my, uh, log shed. And I, I had to run the engine as well, but I ran the winch and the engine at the same time with four wheel driving gauge and I got that thing out of the mud. So I was like, Oh, it's a good thing. There's a winch on here. (laughs) It's a must have if you have it, especially if you're out riding in the woods or something like that by yourself, you have to have the tools to be able to get yourself out of an issue. If you have one, otherwise you might be waiting a while for somebody to come find you. What I also keep in there is a toe strap. It's a, I don't know if it's nylon, but it's a, it's a cloth woven web toe strap that's about 20 feet long with two hooks on it. And it, it folds up pretty compact and it just goes in that little storage cubby on the quad. But um, I also had to use that a couple times. So it's, it's very handy just to have some, some tools. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, you think people are at their destination? I think they're at their destination. Don't forget to pick up trash in the next couple of weeks and maybe post it in the Garden Fork discussion group on Facebook. Yeah, we'll start a trash tag there. All right, cool. All right, everyone, so you can find information about Will and the Weekend Homestead in the show notes here, or just go to YouTube and type in the Weekend Homestead or Facebook and type in the Weekend Homestead, and you'll see uh, pictures of Will and that he never stops and does not drink coffee. So we'll have to talk about that sometime. So Absolutely. All right, make it a great day, everyone, and we will see you later. Garden Fork Radio's executive producer is Jimmy Goots of hollowbooks.com. And our music is licensed from uniquetracks.com. Garden Fork Radio.